Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Getting Started with Custom Connectors in Power Automate. My name is Hugo Bernier. I'm a uh, Principal Program Manager uh, for Microsoft, and with me is David. David? Hi, everyone. I'm David Yak. I'm with Colorado Technology Consultants in Colorado in the U.S. Excited to be here to talk to you about Custom Connectors. Awesome. And this session today, uh, you can join us at aka.ms slash learn live 2023-0523G. Uh, and this actually, in this module, you're going to learn about the role of custom connectors, which are very exciting. And you're also going to build a custom connector and use it in a Power Automate workflow. And by the way, a little tip here is this module will help you get prepared for the exam PL500 Microsoft Power Automate RPA developer. And this session is live and interactive. Well, in theory it is. We have Q&A open, uh, I well, believe, Chad. I'm live, Hugo. Well, Are you live? <laughs> I, I'll try to be as animated as possible. But we've got a bunch of moderators that are ready to answer questions. Absolutely, we do. Uh, so don't hesitate to say hi, ask questions, and we are here to take care of you. All right, so what are some of our learning objectives today? We want to, all right, we want to uh, learn about the role of custom connectors. Custom connectors are a great way to integrate with some of your existing systems and existing APIs. And then we're going to show you how to build a connector and use it in a Power Automate workflow. Now, David, why would you want to create a custom connector? Hugo, thanks for asking me. That's a great question. You know, the reason you want to build a custom connector is because you want to use it with an app or a flow to be able to make it easier and more consistent to be able to use the service, an API that you want to integrate with your application. Now, what's interesting is um, there are a number of pre-built connectors. I think it just topped over a thousand. Does that sound about right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, so you, the first thing you want to do is obviously go see if there's a connector, but if there isn't a pre-built connector, then you can go ahead and you build a custom connector for those. You also might want to build a custom connector if the pre-built connector you found doesn't have all the actions. For example, when I first wanted to use the Vimeo connector, it didn't have some of the things we needed for working with videos. So we had to build a custom connector to extend and, and do the operations. Let's talk a little bit about the steps to build a custom connector, because this is the real fun part. It's not that hard to do. You just have a few things you need to take in mind. The first thing you want to do is identify the, the API that you're going to build the custom connector on. But you know what you want to do before that, Hugo? Uh, I feel that's a trick question. What it is a trick question. <laughs> you want to make sure there's not already one that does what you're looking for, because if there's already one there, you can just add on to it. And so they've been adding tons of custom connectors and certifying them either as certified connectors or independent publishers. I'll talk about that in a second. Then you want to describe the API. This is the fun part because if the service or API already has a definition, and we'll talk more about the options here, this is how you tell the app and the flow what the connector can do with the API. So this is all about describing the API to this for the service. Then once you've done that, and we'll talk about how to adjust it some, you can use the connector. Hugo, I think you're going to show them this later, right? I will. I will, absolutely. And then if you really think it's something that would be useful to other people, you can go ahead and certify or open source or do both. Now, when we talk about certification, you can certify, if you own the API, you can go through the certification process and publish it as a verified publisher. If you're just a community member that built something and think it would be helpful to others in the community, then you can publish it as an independent publisher. Either way makes it so other people can take advantage of it. So let's talk a little bit about how you would actually describe the connector. Now, this is where it gets into, you could simply start from a blank. Have you done the blank one, Hugo? I, uh, I, it, well, yeah, I will show starting a blank and then I'll import uh, import some, some open API. 
That's great. You're going to show them that. So yeah. blank is great when you have maybe one action or a couple actions that you want to configure on the custom connector. Because if you're going to do 20 or 30, you're going to be there a while doing it. And it's not the most efficient. More efficient is if you built the API using any of the Azure services, such as Azure Functions or Azure API Management, you can import it from there. You can also export it from the, each of those services to create the custom connector. And that's a pretty quick way to do that. The other option you have is using an open API file. You might have heard of it as Swagger. Open API is a standard definition for defining the operations and triggers that a service can offer and allows you to quickly bring that in. And we'll show you an example of that as we go through the, the content in a little bit. You can also use Postman. Postman is a REST tool for testing APIs. And so it lets you basically take the API request, make that request to the API, capture the, the request and the response, save it as a collection that you can then import in to create the connector. Not bad, it's a good way to go if you don't have the open API file. Personally, the open API file is the quickest way to get things up and running. The other quick way, Take my example of the Vimeo that had some of the actions that I wanted, but didn't have all of them. And I wanted to add on to that, but I still wanted to keep the existing definitions. I could import from GitHub. Importing from GitHub lets me bring in the definition from an existing open source connector and allows me to make some tweaks to that for my own use. That's very cool. And I have to say that uh, creating from the Azure service is one of my favorite as the world's laziest developer, right? To be able to just point to a, an Azure service and, and get the API, that's beautiful. All right, so how do we authenticate with uh, with those custom API or custom connectors? Well, you're really just using the authentication of the API. And so this is where it's really important when you're basically gonna bring a connector for an API that you go look at the docs for the API. That's where you'll find out what the authentication it requires and what you're con configuring is how the connector is going to talk to the API. And so there's four basic options that are supported. No authentication. This is kind of the free for all. This is your jokes API that gives you back kind of the, the jokes or the message of the day. Nobody cares about security. There is no security. So basic authentication is user and password. You have OAuth 2, which is one of the more common ones. So that could be Azure Active Directory. That could be uh, Facebook. That could be anything that offers OAuth 2. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The final one is API key. An API key allows you to essentially pass an API key that you get from the service. So for example, on our 365 training site, you can get a key and then come to our connector, provide that key and use it to connect to the service and perform the actions on there. Now, OAuth has a little bit of extra configuration that you can go through. So there are different OAuth configurations for each of the different OAuth services. And what the connector designer does is has a quick path for configuring for about 15 to 20 of the different common services that you use. For example, if you can ch check Facebook or Azure Active Directory, it already has the refresh URLs and some of the things you'd have to configure for other services on there. But if yours isn't on the list, that doesn't mean it's not supported. That just means that you have to go get those URLs and you'll have to do a few extra configurations on the connector. Now, why don't we show you a little bit of that experience of how to uh, make a custom connector. And so you can do that using the Maker Portal, right? So you can build that in the Maker Experience. And I'm going to show you how to do that with a, a custom connector. Um, now, I'm using a pet store example. This is based on, uh, in, the, in the learning modules, you'll see that David has actually created a beautiful video that illustrates the same thing I'm going to show you there. So uh, you can follow at home when uh, when you're doing this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use that custom connector. And to do that, again, we need a pet store sample API uh, that will build our connector. So this is the sample API. Now, for those of you who have not used this, this is OpenAPI or also known as Swagger. 
which is a way to describe APIs and all the operations that it can do and everything. So if I go to that custom API, you'll see here that um, I can actually go to my Power Automate portal. I could also use the Power Apps portal. And then from here, what I want to do normally, if I want to create a custom connector, is I'd go to data right here. Then I would go to my custom connectors and I would go on the upper right corner and say new custom connector. And from there, I can just create from blank or I can import any sorts of information that again, uh, David has talked about a little bit earlier. The problem with that is what if you're trying to create a connector that you want to deploy across environments, right? Because what we're doing here is in our default environment uh, or whatever environment this is, but what if I want to create an app and I want to move the app between environments or I want to follow proper application lifecycle management? Uh, David, you got a suggestion? Solutions? That's, that's the right solution. Solutions are the solution. So to do that, we're going to go to right there, solutions. And again, solutions is a way to package your applications and all the assets that you need. And I already have a PetSor management solution that I've created. In the labs, you'll actually be creating your own solution. And in my solution, I have an application, uh, a Canvas app, and I have a uh, workflow or Power Automate workflow that actually calls my custom connector. But let's go add a new connector. And to do that, we're just going to go to new, automation and custom connector. There you go. And then it'll take us through the wizard um, that allows you to create a new custom connector. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, let's go through the steps. So the first thing uh, you should know is that from the general information, you have the ability to create a custom icon, you can put a background color, you can put a description, and you can connect to an on-premise data gateway. Why would you want to do that? Well, if you have an API that's hosted internally, that's only available on your network, you can actually connect to it using an uh, on-premise data gateway. That's a great way to integrate with your legacy systems and to make it available through Power Automate and Power Apps. Okay, but the first thing I should probably do here is I should go uh, provide a host URL. So here I'm lazy, I'll just copy this here. Copy, I'll go here and I'll paste it. And that's the base, base URL that it will use for all the API calls that we'll make. All right, so I can just click on create a connector and of course make sure that I give it a name, connect pet store. It's going to save the connector here. Um, now I've just created the blank connector. I didn't create any operations yet. You're not gonna be and, able to do much with that connector, Hugo. Well, I mean, I can at least say that I created a connector, uh, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's actually go do that. And so here's a little trick here. Um, our actions are empty. Our triggers are empty, nothing is done, right? So, but if I just go back to the previous page, I have a menu here that's available that allows me to import from different things. And the one thing I can do is I can open an open API from a URL. And I just so happen to have the open API URL right here. So let me just copy that. Let me move that over here and paste it, click import and continue. And right away, you'll see that it started to populate some information. I have my description here. And uh, what else do I have? Well, I've got a few things, including some of the activities that are available. So let's go do that here. And we have the security as well. Now the security, you'll notice that my API already says that it uses an API key, uh, but I could change the authentication mechanism if I wanted to. But again, to David's point, you should always respect the security that your API implements. So in this case, we need an API key. All right, so let's move to the definition. 
in definition, you'll see it already created 20 actions that I can use in that API. Again, that's because OpenAPI defines all these calls, but you'll also notice that I have some little uh, blue dots there. And it's saying that every operation needs to have a description. So I'll just say here, upload an image by the user, and it needs an operation ID, but the operation ID is already there. The problem is that operation IDs should always start with an uppercase. And why is that, David? Why do we want to take the time to actually put a summary and a proper operation ID? Well, the op by having the proper summary and operation ID, you'll be able to actually see that from the maker. That's what you're actually going to see. And the operation ID is what you're going to use when you build your apps and use the function, the actions. Yeah, and it's it's really important. Again, remember that when you're creating a connector, you're trying to create something that your makers can use. And you don't want to make it abstract and complicated and use weird names. You want to try to use as user-friendly as possible uh, for, for names and descriptions and things like that. All right. Uh, now you can see as soon as I updated that, it already told me that everything was good. Now you'll see if I go to another operation and look at the body, I can actually edit the body. These are the parameters that I can pass to an operation and action. And you can see that I can edit any of the things that were described here, and I could change the title, description, and the visibility. And visibility is going to be useful later because we can hide things that we don't want to clutter the interface. We can make sure that it only shows up when it's an advanced property and uh, other things like that. But let's move on and let's actually use the Swagger editor. So if you want to see behind the scenes, the code, and I know this is a low code platform, but you do have the full power to be able to go to the Swagger definition. And you'll notice on the right that I have a whole bunch of errors. That's because the way Swagger has defined this API, it shows security. But if I remove some of those security uh, constructs that are not in use right now for uh, the Power Automate connectors, it'll start removing the errors. And you, you can see as I'm going through and removing the, some of the things that are highlighted to me, it's actually removing the errors on the right. Now, through the power of demos, I've actually gone and fixed all that, uh, and I've removed all the errors. Now, I could actually go to my actions, and I could delete actions. Um, I don't want to do that to this one, but um, what if I wanted to import uh, my own action? Let me delete an action that's already there, and then let's go recreate that same action, just so you can see how you have the ability to make customizations. And why would this be useful? Well, again, we talked about uh, what if you have a uh, API or a connector that already exists that doesn't have all the operations you need? Well, you would follow very similar steps to do that. All right, so let's go to the bottom right here, click on new action, and then I will uh, retype the same uh, command that I had before, which is get inventory. And I will give it a description, otherwise it'll scream at me and we don't want Power Automate to scream at me. And we'll put an operation ID and remember the operation ID should have an uppercase. Now we can control whether we want that action to be available and visible to our users. Uh, but more importantly right now, what I should probably do is go look at, there you go. So I can go look at, uh, the request. So how do I make the request? Now I've got all these things like get, delete, post. How do I know what it is? Well, if you go back to the open API definition, you'll see that the get inventory command or action uh, starts with get. It's a get operation. So I know that I'm going to use that. And I can also see a sample of what the responses look like. Uh, but because I'm lazy, I'm just going to go and copy the information right here. All right, so now let's go back to that definition for that new action. I'm going to say it's a get, and I'm just going to paste a URL. Now you'll notice the URL is a relative URL. You could put an absolute URL if you wanted to, but everything is already defined uh, to relative to the base URL that I uh, created when I first created the connector. So save yourself some trouble and just continue using your relative connect uh, URLs here. All right, now we need to actually also understand what the response is going to be like. 
So let's just go add a default response. And again, because I'm the world's easiest developer, I don't want to type all that set this stuff in. Let's go look at what the responses look like. There's a few ways to do this. I like to just click on execute and then go look at the response body and copy. I think David likes to call the API directly uh, and copy from the page. Um, again, I, I like that it has a little handy copy button. So, Postman uh, is also a good way to do that. That's you... true. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. So here now I have the same thing that I had before. I have all my uh, my response information with the body, uh, the definition of how the body is going to respond, and all sorts of good things like that. All right, so now let's click on Update Connector. And David, this is the part where you and I need to banter because updating the connector can take some time. Well, I guess I could ask, why didn't you update the connector before the session? All you wanted to show us. <laughs> I wanted well, to see, show look, it. there it's ready for you. There you go. So, okay, now all I need to do is I go to the test, I click on new uh, connection, and I pass my API key. Now, my API key is a very special API key. Oh, don't well, tell them what key. the key is. Oh, I'm sorry. This is not recorded, is it? All right, I'm so now I've created the connector. And so if I refresh the page, I now have my connector. And I should be able to now, if I go to get inventory, that's the one I just created, I click on test operation. I will see, hopefully, if the demo gods are with me. Yes, I see results. There you go. So that was creating a custom connector. Now in the labs, you're going to do something similar and I will walk you through these steps a bit later. But before we do, let's talk about what uh, we want to do with exploring custom connectors and configuration options with David. All right, so now that you've got a basic connector, so you what you got is whatever the API defined and whatever the open API brought in or whatever the definitions you'd had, but you want to think about how the names and de descriptions are used and do some adjustments in some cases. You want to think about action visibility. You also want to think about the request and the response because the request is what the maker is going to pass in to use the action. The response is what they're going to use to consume the output that's on there, and that's it's really important to think about. So it all starts with when you name the connector. So you got to pick a good name. Uh, you can have up to 30 characters. You, you can get creative if you want, but th think about this is this is for the maker to figure out, do I want to use this connector? That's where the description and the name come in. And I think the icon is also important. You'll notice the C is very Contoso-like. It's very clear that you can see it when your flow has 10 actions from the Contoso connector. You can see them real quickly. And people don't spend the time to do this, but if you think about it, if you've got over a thousand connection connectors available to have that little mnemonic device that allows you to see the C and the color that represents your brand, it makes it easy for people to find it. You know, I want to do try that, do one flow that has every single connector in it just to see what it looks like. <laughs> That'd be cool. All right. So All then right. you get into, once you've gotten past that, then you get into naming your actions and your triggers. And now, I, I cr actually once created one that just used A, B, C, D, and so forth for the action names. It was kind of funny. I was going to use it for a demo. But you, you just want to pick names that are meaningful because, again, somebody's building a flow. They're using the app. They're going to get in the prompt. You know, as they type the, con the connector name, they're going to see the actions that are available. They're going to have to pick which one to use. So instead of saying add, you'd say add invoice. Instead of saying get invoice or get, you'd say get invoice and make it a little bit more consumable. That's actually a very good point because you, you want to be able to see these actions out of context and understand what they do. And Hugo talked about this a little bit briefly in his demo, but the action visibility is also important. So you may look at that and say, it says none. Does that, Hugo, does that mean it doesn't show? <laughs> no, it just means it's the, it's the default, right? It's the default. So if you pick none on everything, they're all just going to show up in alphabetical order in the list that's there. Uh, if you go ahead and you want to give priority to some, you can 
choose the uh, the important. Obviously, it puts it at the top. You don't want to make everything important because then it's just like none. So do that. If you know if there's two or three things that 99% of the people use, important is a great way to highlight them. Uh, advanced says, hey, this action is a little more advanced. That everybody doesn't need it. It really matters if you have 20 or 30 actions. It puts it at the bottom so that you have to click the see more and the, the flow action list to be able to get to it. And then the other one is the internal. So you don't have to put hide or hidden or X in front of the name to get it to go to the bottom. If you have an action that you don't want people to use, and this is not uncommon. It may be that you don't want to expose all the actions, but you're not ready to delete them from the definition because maybe later you'll make them available. You can mark them as internal and they won't show up to the maker. And that's a great way to kind of shield them from the complexity of the overall API. Yeah, that's smart because uh, if you ever want to update your API from the API definition, you don't have to go redo everything because you've got your your settings there, right? Well, yeah, you go delete it, and then you're going to realize two weeks later somebody's going to come and say, "Hey, can you add that action back in?" And you're going to have to go fig figure it all out. Very smart. So the request, the think about these is what you're going to provide when you, you at, configure the step on the Power Automate flow. These are the things that are going to show up on there. So again, the names matter. And a lot of times the APIs that you use, even if you import an open API definition, won't have good meaningful names on them. They'll be more developer names. And you'll want to edit these to provide the good names. Now, one thing to be aware of, if you do edit the names on the configuration, of these different things. If you re-import that open API file, guess what happens? Hugo, you know what happens, don't you? Yeah, it's like uh, deja vu all over again. Yes, you're back to ground zero. So, I mean, keep that in mind. If you own the API, the better way to do that is to go back to the API developers and say, hey, can you provide some more meaningful descriptions? We're using this in low code. And that would be a better way because if you round trip update it again, you won't have problems with it overriding your customizations on there. Although a little tip here is if you go to the Swagger view, you can copy and paste uh, and put stuff back in. But again, go to the source, right? It's just a lot easier. So the other side of the request is, well, the response. So this is what you're getting back. Now, APIs can give you different shaped responses. So when things are good, it may give you these answers. When things are bad, it may give you an error message. So this is where you can define the different HTTP codes. So 200 is an HTTP code that you're defining what the fields are for that response that comes back on there. And if you have an API that gives different responses, you can configure them and customize them from here. And the default is what's used if it's not defined for the other ones. Ah, validation. It tries to help you. It tries <laughs> to make it so it's easy for you. It gives you a list. It puts the little blue dots. Um, look at the validation at the bottom, uh, the, the different sections. This will tell you if you have anything you need to pay attention to. Uh, red is just like a traffic light. You need to stop and do something. It's not going to let you proceed. The other ones you have some flexibility on, it's just whether you're lazy like Hugo or efficient like Dave. <laughs> See what I did oh, there, that, Hugo? Is that what we're calling it? <laughs> what about the other settings? The other settings, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do with custom connectors. And, you know, one of the things we didn't mention about the learn modules is there are five or six other, besides the first one that we're going through today, there's five or six other ones that go through some more advanced topics on custom connectors. So I highly recommend uh, after you take the time to do this one that you go through the whole learning path on there. Uh, but things like the, the triggers, uh, you can actually define events that cause your connector to, to run the flow. Um, so that's a little more advanced. Not all APIs support triggers. Uh, you have to either support web hooks or polling, and the API has to support that to be able to configure them. Uh, we show examples of that in the learning path as you go further. Uh, you can also have references. References are reusable definitions. So you'll see that in some APIs will actually show up as in, in the model section that they have objects that are reused within the API. 
And then the other thing is policies. Policies allow you to do things like set the host name and kind of tailor the connector to make it easier to work with the API. And you can do some data transformation on the request and response to handle certain scenarios with APIs that need that help. Now, in the labs or in the, the learning module, we have a few exercises and I, it should look very familiar because we just pretty much showed you again the process, but I'll show you exactly what you'll get to see, right? So in the, the exercise, you'll actually get a page where you can you can find a definition uh, or open an API for Contoso invoicing, if I could speak. Um, you can also get the open API definition file. And in fact, what we'll do is we'll just save it. You can see I've done this a few times already, uh, but I'll just save it on my uh, my downloads folder. And uh, then that's all I need for that, I think. Well, I let me go download the logo. We want to make it pretty. You right? got to have so, the logo, Hugo. Yeah. I, I again, just talked about how the logo is important. It is important. Uh, thousand connectors, you don't want to compete with that. All right, so once you've downloaded all this good stuff, let's go, if I can find the right tab, there you go. Let's go create a new solution. Now, we're uh, we're going to call it Contoso Invoicing. We're gonna pick the default publisher. I would prefer to use a custom publisher, but in the labs, we're just trying to speed it up a little bit. And then you would do the same steps we did before. Go and you add a new custom connector. And then instead of, uh, you know, typing or leaving everything blank like we did before, we're actually going to start filling all the information. So we're gonna upload the logo, we're gonna copy the background color in the labs, we actually tell you where the background colors are. We're gonna put some description in there uh, and I'm using my clipboard to make it faster because trust me, you don't wanna watch me type, uh, we only have an hour. And then we'll put the, the host, again, this is the base URL we wanna use and then we'll create the connector. And you'll notice here, I it automatically called it Contoso Invoicing 1 because I already had a Contoso Invoicing when I was practicing this, make sure I didn't break anything, uh, but it's saving the connector. And now we are ready. We're gonna use the same trick that we did before, except that now instead of using a, a API URL, an open API URL, we're going to use the open API file that we just downloaded. So let's do that, click on, the little three dots, open API file, select the file that I just downloaded called swagger.json. And now I have all my operations that I brought in. And again, if we take a look at the security now, it should automatically say that it's using an API key. And if I look at the definition, I should have a whole bunch of actions. Now in the lab, the open API definition we've given you is missing a few things. You need to have a summary. Uh, so let's just see, that's why you don't wanna watch me type. I can't, turns out when you don't have labels on your keys, it makes it really hard to type when you're putting your fingers on the right keys. I just feel you're making tip. excuses, Hugo. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's my go-to excuse. All right, and then we'll put a description on the pay invoice, just because again, we wanna be nice people and we wanna make sure that we're supporting our makers they understand what each action does. All right, and so what else do I need to do? Uh, the, uh, let's see here. So we can put some descriptions. Okay, so now we got your get invoice schema. You know what, that's an internal API. We don't want people to get to see that. Uh, you'll often see internal APIs like that, like get version, get schema, things like that. We don't want to expose that to our makers. They don't need to have access to this. All right, so, and then I, apparently I forgot to paste my host and let's update the connector. So it wouldn't be a demo if I didn't do something wrong at some point. We're saving the connector. And so now what we've done again, it's pretty much the same thing I just showed you before, but that's actually the steps we'll walk you through in the labs. And what else do we have to do? Well, we want to test. So we're going to go create always a Always test connection. your work. Yeah, I mean, I, I always test in production personally. All right, so go create a new connector. We're going to create an API key. Now in the labs, we're not using a 
uh, generic key, we have a dynamically generated key for you. So go copy that. You go paste that in your API key and create your connection. Now, here's the thing that uh, may throw you off a little bit. If your connection doesn't show up, you got that little refresh button right here. Click on that, it will bring that newly created connection. And then let's go pick the list invoices. Where is it? List invoice types. Okay, let's pick in list invoice types and test operations. And look at that, we have a body. So we actually called the API and uh, from a custom connector. That was pretty easy. So again, this is the exercise that you're going to do in a solution. Uh, now, what else are we going to do? We're going to use a connector. And to use a connector, David, I think this is the part where you tell us how to use a custom connector. Well, it's quite simple. It shows up in the list of connectors. I mean, there is a tab on there that you can click on custom, and it, it is nice because it shows just the custom ones that are in your environment. The key thing to remember about custom connectors is they're defined in a single environment. So if you want to use them in other environments, you have to move them or redefine them in those other environments. So the first stop option that you have, if you want to use, let's say, in environment B, is you could download the definition from environment A and import it into environment B and essentially recreate it. It would be just like importing, like Hugo showed in the example there. Not the most efficient way to do that. The other way that you can do that is using solutions. So that's what we saw with the Contoso uh, invoicing API. We saw that we could create it in a solution. Then when we export the solution, import it into another environment, uh, we could rehydrate that and make it available for use in that other environment. Now, one thing to be aware of, there is a current limitation of Canvas apps. Uh, if you're doing that and you're not doing Power Automate Flows, Power Automate Flows can see the connector in the same solution. But Canvas apps right now, I, I believe there's still an outstanding issue where they can't see the connector if it's in the same solution. So the, the solution for that is you just have that in a separate solution for right now. The other one way that you can do these is using the command line utility. So there's a Power Apps Platform Connectors command line interface that allows you to download the assets. Now, the most common reason people want to do this is because they want to open source it or go through the certification process. This gives you the individual files. It's also in preview for the Power Apps CLI, the developer CLI, to do the similar type of operations. And effectively, that will become the probably the preferred path for doing the CLI operations in the future. And I, I let's go back for a moment about the downloading and importing because um, I've heard a lot of customers that will say, "Oh, you know, we we strongly follow uh, Dev QA UAT production." And then they actually download and re-import at every step, right? <laughs> they recreate it in each one. Yeah, so you're essentially invalidating your testing. There's no point in doing this, right? If you're if you're going to go through an application lifecycle management process where you want to go through, you know, again testing and and uh, UATing and going to production, you want to make sure you're not changing the variables at all. You're not introducing new bugs between versions. So make sure to use something like a solution to move your connectors uh, between and and your assets between them. Yeah, I mean, most people would use the solutions or the command line tools to do the movement because they get all the assets then. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I use the command line because I can script it and I'm lazy. But uh, wait, have we mentioned that? I see a theme <laughs> that's coming along. <laughs> all right, so let's do uh, in the in the learn module, you have another exercise which is using a connector uh, from Power Automate. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use a manually triggered Power Automate cloud flow that we'll call the Contoso invoicing that we just created before. Now, you might say, well, I don't really use a manually triggered uh, Power Automate workflow. I want to use some other triggers. You would follow the same process. It's just, it's a lot easier to demo a manually triggered process and to wait for like a SharePoint document or an email to come in uh, to be able to demonstrate that. So how do I do that? Well, I go to that same solution that I created and I will create a Cloudflow, uh, but we're going to create an instant Cloudflow. 
and then we're going to here i could you know just skip everything and go manually define everything but i'm a nice person i will actually uh, say what the flow is supposed to do uh, please take the time to name your workflows and then yeah i could skip all the definitions and everything but let's go to our uh, manual trigger and then uh here I have my manual trigger. So what do I need to do? I need to create my first step because our flows should probably do something useful. If I go to the, connect, the custom connector, as David showed before, I can just go find the connector I want. I want the list invoice. And now I have to name uh, my connection because it's going to create a connection for me. So let's give it a name. Again, this is the part where you watch me type. Super exciting. There you go, invoice connection and the API key. We have that API key from the lab. So let's go copy that. Let's go paste that in here. And if everything goes well, I've created my connector. Now I have some parameter in the list invoice that I could call, but I'm not going to use any of those. I just want to show all the invoices here. So because you're lazy. Because I'm lazy. Have we mentioned that? Uh, okay, so I'll just save this. And now I should be able to test it, right? So we could go back to the previous page and test it. I think it's saving. There you go, it's saved. So now I can actually go test it. And um, I, just to show you that it got created inside the solution, because that's kind of important, I can just go click on it again and let's run it. And to run it, okay, what do we do? We just click on run. I could have also tested it, but that was boring. And then click on continue and I'll run the flow. And it said it has run successfully. Now you can see uh, in my 28 day run history, I can actually go click on that workflow and you'll see that, uh, come on, there you go. It completed, it actually called list invoices and it gave me a whole bunch of invoices so do we get the money when the invoices get paid that's what i wanted to know that's the part i'm trying to create a swiss bank connector that uh that can take care of that uh for now we'll just email some money come back um, for next build for that absolutely all right so we've gone through all this uh what do you say we we keep our audience awake by asking them some questions I think we should see if they've been paying attention. Awesome. Uh, now we have some polls and you can actually vote at our polls at aka.ms poll dash G or follow the QR code. And let me just bring the poll right here. There you go. So the first one is you've been asked to build a Power Automate flow that uses an API from Fabricam, and you have decided to build a custom connector because a built-in connector is not available. See, they listen to you, David. After reviewing the API documentation, you discover that it has an open API definition file and examples that could be used with Postman. Considering the possibilities, which approach makes the most sense to quickly get started building the custom connector? I'm reading this to give people a chance to actually respond. Yeah, we've got some different options on here. So you could use the Postman collection and then import the collection. You could import the open API definition. You could import the open API file as a reference and then manually add the custom connector. I'm just gonna help them out a little bit. Manually adding from the open API definitions probably isn't the most efficient way to do it. Do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know me. <laughs> if, I can, if I can go directly to the open API definition file. I, I just saw the word manual in there and that, that was the hint for me. That's right. That's right. So looks uh, like a bunch of votes are coming in. Yeah. So um, let's give it a few more seconds. What do, do you think of run the world? samples and capture the network trace? That that seems pretty low level to me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I I've done something like that in the past, but it's probably not the most uh, efficient thing to do. Uh, but that's definitely if you ever need to reverse engineer something that has not been documented. But hey, we're looking for the best solution here. So let's reveal the answer. You ready? I'm ready. B. Ah, B. 
Beautiful. And you know what? Most people got the answer right. Yeah, that and was again, good. I wouldn't say that all the answers were wrong. It's just some were better than others. All right. How so about another next, one, Hugo? The next question. Okay, fine. Uh, hopefully I don't have to read as long. Which of the following authentication types is not supported by custom connectors? Well, I don't know about you, but I brought my cookies. <laughs> now you're just teasing me. Um, yeah, I think we mentioned it once or twice, right? Uh, so let's see what people are saying. But you got API key and you got OAuth, you got anonymous, you got several options on here that you could go for. And you have several flavors of OAuth as well. So is that uh, like flavors of cookies? <laughs> it all comes back to cookies. Well, let's reveal the answer. It's B cookies. Cookie authentication. Oh, you got the cookie on there. I got it. Just in case you're not ready. All right. And the then Oreos. <laughs> last question. You have built a custom connector and want to make it available to other companies similar to built-in connectors. What would you do? What should you do? Hmm. We didn't really talk about that, did we? No, we we, we didn't. But I think we gave them some clues, the things mm -hmm. that could work. So I, actually, I did talk about it a little bit in the early part. Actually, when we went through true. the different stages, we we that's did true. talk about it. That's true. All so right. they're on so the let's hook. Let's see if people remember. You have no. Were they listening now. to me at that point? <laughs> uh, well, so again, to reiterate, by the way, you uh, a lot of our our custom connectors that are there, and there was a question in the chat that we it looks like we're going to have enough time to answer. Um, it is possible to get your custom connectors certified and to make them available to other people. So I guess the answer is. B. B. And one of the questions I did see in the chat when I peeked over there, um, does import or export of solutions work from one tenant to another? And I, one of the things you can do with solutions is that once you've exported them, you can import them into other uh, environments. In fact, when you go through the later um, modules in the learn, uh, it actually gives you the ability to download a pre-built solution. So if you just happen to jump into module three, that solution is there. So you absolutely, I could give it to Hugo. Hugo could import it into his environment and that custom connector definition would be there. Absolutely. Um, hey, you know what? I think we have enough time for an extra question. Bonus question. Bonus question round. Four. You have imported an open API definition and it included 10 actions. For now, two actions should not be visible to users of the connectors, but you might make them available later. What should you do to implement this preference? Sounds like that's something we talked about. We did. So again, you wanna make sure that you're able to, uh, if the open API definition gets updated, you wanna be able to re-import it and you don't wanna lose all your changes. So, that would be bad. Yeah, that would be bad. All right, let's see how we're doing here. Do we have people responding? Oh yeah, we got some votes. It's, it's like, 90, it looks it 90 looks percent like- 90% are getting it right. Yeah, looks like most people were still awake when we talked about this. All right, let's reveal the answer. B, select them as internal. Again, selecting them as internal prevents them from showing up, but it will retain their definition for future use. So uh, the great thing about and that- And it's much cleaner yeah. than putting hidden or do not use. It's kind of like emails. You ever get those emails that say recall? What's the first thing you do when you get an email that's been recalled? You look at it. <laughs> What's the first thing you do when an action yeah. says don't use? You're going to look at using it. Absolutely. In fact, when this forms that says, do not write anything here for office use only, I'll write OK. <laughs> um, so, all right. So let's uh, maybe summarize this a little bit. So in summary, what did we talk about today? Well, we learned about the role of custom connectors. Again, custom connectors are a great way to integrate with APIs that don't have connectors already available or that are missing functionality you're looking for. 
but also, and that's my favorite use of, of custom connectors, is the ability to connect to your own APIs, both internal and cloud uh, connected APIs. That's huge. And then build a connector and use it in a Power Automate flow. But again, we could use it in uh, other scenarios, but that was uh, today's easiest way to do it within the timeline that we had. And one of the things I'll call out is the independent publisher program. Uh, if you start liking building some of the custom connectors, there's a real movement to define connectors that can be published for some of the APIs that aren't out there. And this is a great way to really help and give back to the community. You can use your skills building the custom connectors to fill in the gaps of connectors that aren't already there. Absolutely. Um, now we have a few questions in the chat. Should we uh, should we look at some of these? Because we have uh, some that are topical right now. One is should we or can we trust third party connectors? Uh, I'm concerned that I don't see a certification. And uh, again, you well, can do your own custom. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, here's the thing to remember about connectors. Connectors just define how to talk to the API. They're all about information about what the actions are, what the the responses are, the requests. They don't actually do any logic unless there's transformations that are in there. So when you say trust the, the you know that connector, what you're really trusting is the definition. And if you look at any of the the published connectors, you can actually go out and look at the definitions if you want to see what's in the GitHub repository because they're all open sourced. Yeah, what's that saying? Trust but certify. Or verify, I think, is what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, again, the certification makes sure that uh, the the connector is not making calls to other locations that shouldn't be used, right? Uh, but ultimately, you are trusted trusting an API that you're calling because that's all we're doing. And that's I think that's really important uh, to remember that. Uh, now, someone also said, Jim said, I've tried in the past to create a custom connector for our API, but it seems the custom connector framework does not support the OAuth 2.0 refresh token grant. And I think there's a little bit more to that. Uh, grant for yeah, okay. I mean, it does yeah. support refresh token. I mean, there's the refresh URL you configure on there, so I'm not sure where that's going with that. I think, and they, um, you actually showed when you looked at the various flavors of OAuth 2.0, uh, you were showing some that had refresh uh, token authentication. Uh, that might be from a while ago. Yeah. Awesome. And then um, there's there's a bit of a gap at the moment around APIs that require basic plus API key authentication. Is the best way to do this still to use basic authentication and then use a policy to you to force the API key into the header of every request, or is there a better way? Hmm. I have not run into that. I've not done one that needs both on there, but um, some of the, the transformation, I, I would look at possibly some of the transformations and see if you could accomplish that. Check out the policy uh, module and see if it helps you get a little bit further along with that. Uh, also look at some of the code transformations that's in preview right now. I, hopefully it'll be out of preview soon, but there's a lot of cool things you can do to adapt and deal with some of the nuances of APIs uh, using the code or the policies. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else here that we can uh, leverage. Uh, the one thing I would say though is, um, um, you know, one thing you sh people should remember when they're creating solutions and connections to things is remember also that you have the ability to create a connection reference uh, as well. So you can actually create your connection in each environment and point to uh, your, instead of bringing the connection into that solution, you're using a connection reference that requires uh, basically every when you import the solution, it will reestablish a connection to each environment. I know that's not exactly what you're looking for here, but um, I got a few ideas here. All right. Well, let's go back to our unless there's more questions. Or David wants to import more wisdom. 
I was just going to remind everybody to go through the other modules because I, I think it's really important to kind of round off the other topics on the custom connectors. And there's some really good examples in there as you go through them. And you've got the link up. I do. Uh, I'm not going to read it again, but uh, there's a QR code right there. And again, there's a, a beautiful video uh, created by David that shows you the same stuff that I showed you earlier, but I'm sure it's much more eloquent than I did. <laughs> uh, and bonus is you don't have to watch David type everything. All right. So uh, this was it. So let's just put in our last slide here thank you everyone for joining us make sure to join the microsoft learn uh, cloud skill challenges because you get free certification exam exams by completing the uh, collections of microsoft learn and you got until june 20th and of course uh, dive deeper right microsoft learn collections has tons of uh, the latest learning content in fact david you're updating some of that content regularly aren't you there's been a bunch of updates. That's awesome. Even before we were preparing for this thing, David was making updates. Uh, so you know you have the latest uh, on Microsoft Learn Collections. And then make sure to connect with the Microsoft Learn community uh, so you can engage with a whole bunch of people. And of course, you should also go to AK to the mess slash join the community and go to the Power Platform community and make sure that you interact with our people in the community. And most of all, go build a custom connector. Absolutely. And I, honestly, if you're building a custom connector, and we we met with Jocelyn Penchal uh, a few weeks ago on uh, the show that David Warner and I do, and we were asking her, hey, is there a connector that's too small? And as far as we're concerned, there's no such a thing as too small of a connector because there's always a business scenario. I mean, you were talking about the Vimeo connector, uh, there's all sorts of connectors like that that you can leverage. If if you find it useful, someone else is bound to find it useful. Yep. All right. Especially, well, that's especially it for us. any connectors you build for things that other people use. Your internal APIs, most people don't want to see them, but if it's something public that they can take advantage of, those are great examples that you should look at publishing. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I think that's a wrap, Hugo. Everyone I have know. a great day. Thank you, everyone, for attending. If you liked uh, if you liked the session, my name is Hugo. If you didn't like it, my name is my name is David. I see what you did there. <laughs> All right. Oh, we have uh, Ben. If you want to post some uh, some questions in the chat, we're gonna keep an eye for a couple more minutes. Unfortunately, I don't think that uh, you're able to unmute, so you'll have to chat uh, or use the Q and A to post your questions. David, I'm just sticking here for another couple minutes. Just in case people have questions. There's one that just came in. Is there an application for Power Automate use case commercial invoices and shipping lists in Dynamics 365? Sounds right up your alley, Hugo. Let me go read that. The Power Automate use case commercial invoice and shipping lists in D365. Hmm. I would go out to the Dynamics 365 community and post that on there. That's probably where you're going to get the best answer for that right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, my immediate answer is yes, but there's also uh, <laughs> several D365 applications here. So I'd love to understand a little bit more uh, how you want to use that, but absolutely, there are solutions like that. And for those of you who are still around, don't forget that your feedback is important. You can go to AKMS Microsoft Build Evals and uh, let people know that we should come back next year. At least David should. 
Uh, and then uh, Trisha is asking, can environment variables be used in custom connectors? Actually, yes. There's in preview right now that you can do some actions with them. Um, so check out the docs. Uh, that's a little bit beyond the basics. And because they're in preview, it's not in the learn content yet. Uh, but it is on the docs part of learn. Uh, so you can kind of look at how to use them and where they can apply. Um, one cool thing, by the way, that uh, I don't know if we, well, we didn't get to talk about it, but you can also associate uh, C Sharp scripts to your connectors. Yeah, that's Very the cool. code uh, transformations. Code transformations, that's right. It's the code tab. Well, I think we're at the top of the hour. They're probably going to boot us out of here. So they are. Uh, let's say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you later. Thank you, David.